Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Yao. Leadership is harder than it looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into the great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Stefano Virgili is the marketing director of Mitigram, the world's largest marketplace for trade finance. Founded in 2015 in Sweden, Mitigram supports network creation and expansion for corporates and financial institutions. Comprehensive automated quotation workflows, audit trail, analytics on asset pricing, and activity data across multiple trade finance instruments. It currently facilitates more than $2.5 billion worth of transactions per month and has spearheaded over $55 billion worth of transactions across 1,000 issuers and more than 100 countries. Before Mitigram, Stefano was the CEO of Pocket Money, a credit startup that aimed to bring innovation in the lending industry by creating a global marketplace for lenders and borrowers. He built an online community with members in 25 countries and managed an investment of 750,000 US dollars. He was also the CEO of Vox.sg, a podcast startup that interviews startup founders and CEOs globally and asks them about the origins of their ventures, achievements, pain points, challenges with fundraising, competition, and technology. Stefano has had 20 years of experience as a veteran public speaker and strategic consultant and specializes in empowering progressive business leaders to maximize their performance and potential of their teams through speaking, mentoring, and consulting. He is a six times TEDx speaker and a keynote speaker at over 90 conferences. He has ventured in Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Southeast Asia, leading and or participating close to 30 businesses and startups. Stefano graduated from the Università del Progetto with a diploma in communications and design. He holds over 80 certifications and is the most certified Adobe trainer in the global arena, having trained 14,000 participants in his career. Hey, Stefano. Good to have you on board. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's such a great way for us to connect because you have so much experience across so many different cultures and countries, and you worked on deals and companies from high growth to global expansion. And that's something I'm really excited to share your experience and personal journey with so many other people. I'm very excited too, Jeremy. Thank you for inviting me. So for those meeting you for the first time in a new country, how would you introduce yourself? question. So I'm Stefano, I'm Italian, born Italian, and then uh, spent most of my professional life actually out of Italy. I moved to Singapore in 2007, and then I had an experience in the Middle East for four years in Oman, and then one year in uh, Africa, in Uganda, and then back to Singapore. Now, currently, I'm in Malaysia. So that's my logistic presentation, because it, it talks mostly about where I lived, but I think it also carries a weight in terms of uh, what I've learned culturally in adapting myself to different cultures, different food, different everything, ways of working, work ethics, and government relation, and all the rest. I am the father of three children that are scattered around because I married twice. So I have two children in Dubai and one child in Uganda. I am currently focused on uh, marketing, which has been the underpinning uh, strength throughout my career ever since I started working at age uh, 16. And I'm working currently as marketing director for Mitigram, which is a fintech company based in Sweden working specifically in the trade finance uh, segment and uh, corporate treasury of uh, finance. Amazing. And could you share with us what first brought you out to Southeast Asia? Well, I'm an Italian. You know, we are romantic. So I fell in love with a Singaporean beautiful girl that became then my wife. And we have two beautiful children. I will also say that, yes, that there was the magnet that pulled me out, but I had already the intention of leaving Italy. 
In 2006, I was already working for about 10 years. I was uh, tired of Italy. I was tired of uh, taxation, which was at the time, I think was one of the highest taxation in the world. I was tired of winter because I come from a very cold place in Italy. I was tired of crime because at that point in time, I was staying actually in a city that had quite a spike in, they call it the uh, soft crime over there, but still it was burglary, you know, like pocketing, this type of things that make you sleep bad at night. I was interested in uh, speaking more English because at that time my English was not good at all. It's not good now, but uh, it, back then it was a disaster. And so I, I needed to move to a place where I was forced to speak English on a daily basis. And also I was a bit annoyed with the cost of living because when we went through the transition from Italian lira as a currency to euro as a currency, we were penalized by an unfavorable exchange rate where our unit of exchange, which was the 1,000 lira back then, was the price of a coffee, became uh, one euro, whereas the exchange rate was 1.93627, <laughs> which was basically doubling every price. I've seen this one happening with, with a coffee that went from 1,000 lira to one euro. I've seen this happening with a pizza, speaking to Italian stereotypes from 6,000 lire up to 6 euros, and also for properties from 100, 100 million uh, lira for an apartment in my city to 100,000 euro, which basically doubled the price of everything. And so I wanted to move to a place that have these five uh, parameters. And I found Singapore, where I, I could satisfy all of them. You, 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 you might be too young to remember this one. <laughs> there was a time in 2006 where Singapore was actually affordable. I used to pay $2 for a chicken rice. My first rental in Singapore was 1,100 Singapore dollars, which probably now doesn't even get you a room. And I got the chance to speak more Singlish than English at that time. <laughs> but taxation was definitely very favorable. And I started opening companies in, in Singapore. I became a PR in 2007, so it made it even easier for me to be part of the business ecosystem over there. And obviously, very, very little crime. One heck of a journey. And I'm glad you made out here. And obviously, I'm sure that you must have seen tons of different leaders along the way. You've seen different companies that you've led or been a manager in or you know, started out in. Now, how have you seen examples of great leadership versus not so great leadership? That's a very good question. Actually, when I was a kid in Italy, I say a kid, I was a teenager and I was still, and I was already working. I had multiple projects that I was working at. And uh, one of them was an insurance agency. And one of the leaders there, Jacopo Baldini, really changed my life forever, I'd say, because leadership style that was phenomenal. It was so fun to be with him. And yet, because it was so fun to be with him and everyone wanted to be around him, he was strict when he needed to be strict and everyone was willing to comply with his rules because it was so fun to be with him. He was a magnet, a very handsome Italian gentleman, never saw him not wearing a suit, never saw him not having the belt matching the shoes or the tie matching the socks. He was perfect. And it was probably my age now, and I was 25 years younger than, 20 years younger than now. So it, looking at it with hindsight, it shaped my way of communicating, definitely, or running businesses, because I always try to make it fun. I never got to the level that, that he was. He was a phenomenal leader, but I managed to implement rules within my organizations that were uh, digested often, not 100% of the times, but they say in 80% of the times, if you speak to people that have worked with me, they will probably have good memories. I have some former employees that write me 10 years down the road. They say, hey, you, you really changed my career path. Or they will say things, I really have fond memories of working uh, with you. I had some uh, of my employees that one year after working with me, they say, hey, today is my work anniversary uh, working in this company. And I mean, if they remember, it means that they made a note to bring that up. So I always try to make everyone feel comfortable and special. But I used to be hot temper, and so there was a battle that took me about 10 to 15 years to win. Nowadays, I will evaluate uh, leadership based on how quickly someone loses their temper. And because now I very seldom lose my temper, I'm, I'm super chill, super cool. Whenever there is a problem, I like, okay, bring it on. Let's see how we can solve this one. And when I work with someone that loses their temper, that really hurts. I had an experience in 2017 with someone that I will not mention, but it was my boss for a while and used to 
slam the table, punch the table, shout. Uh, and I kept my cool during those uh, times working there. But then whenever I had the occasion, it's like, hey, I'm not the one that punched the table then. So whenever, you are the one that let this thing aggravate you and affect you. And I think we can work together without reaching that point where you get angry at the client or you try to be one person on the phone with the client. You try to be cool and accommodating, but then when you hang up the phone, you start shouting bad words about that client. I think it's just, you're just two-faced. And the best way for me, in my opinion, the best way to live is to be absolutely frank, not two-faced, transparent whenever it's possible. No need to say everything, but whatever you say, you say it from the bottom of your heart, having thought through it without hidden agenda, which I think is the worst thing that anyone can have, a hidden agenda. Uh, when leading a company and just be absolutely frank. If someone is not performing, I think the best thing that you can tell them is, hey, you're not performing and the company needs to be focused on performing. I've learned how to draw a line between friendship and business and seldom I make things look personal. Or I would say the older I grow, the more wisdom I earn, uh, the more I would say that is clear to me that one thing is being friends and one thing is being professional on the job. There's a huge truth in what you said, which is that the leaders and managers that we looked up to or that we learned what not to do when we first started our careers, you know, we're now at that age of those managers and leaders, right? And it's funny when you put it that way, it's, it's crazy how those, you know, 10, 20 years can really make a difference, right? In terms of us realizing our own shortfalls and what we have to do differently. You mentioned that being, you know, one of your learning points over the years. Was there anything else that you struggled with, you know, as you cross borders and build out your own communications and, you know, leadership skills over time? Yes, definitely. Even recently, now working with a Swedish company, and you probably are aware that Sweden is a socialist country, which means that everyone's opinion matter. And when you work in Asia, it's different because some of the countries had dictatorship not, not far ago, like 30 years ago. And, and some of them, they are under stringent control of what you can say and what you cannot say it's until now, until today, which from one perspective sounds funny, from another perspective sounds strange. So I learned how to coexist with the environment. So probably the same way Jim Rohn says it, he say that, that's all you got is the environment where you are. So either you change to accommodate the environment because the environment will not change to accommodate you. And so I'd say that, yes, adapting is a simple matter of being open. So when I joined the Swedish company, I talked to the team and I say, hey, it's the first time for me working for a Swedish company. I'd like you to teach me what is the Swedish culture. And so some of them were very kind. They sent me some links on YouTube to listen more about the culture. Some other, they told me, hey, these are the things that you shouldn't say. These are the things they should say. But when I went to uh, Middle East, that was very interesting. I, I went for a meeting, and during the meeting, one of the in the meetings in the Middle East are, are large. So there, there was one meeting where my team were five of us, and the clients' team, there were 20 of them sitting in front of us. So one of them came up with something that, if I had to use a frank word, I would say, no, don't do that. But I know that, that in the Middle East, there is a different degree of sensitivity to what you can say, what you cannot say. So I say, I would strongly advise against it. That was my sentence. So at the end of the meeting, while I was uh, driving back with my business partner there, which was an Arab, he told me, don't use that word again. Don't use strong. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you mean? And they say, well, if you say you strongly advise, then you are emphasizing that you're stronger than him. And he might not like it. And so I, I've learned that I have to modulate my communication to make sure that it doesn't sound that way. But if I use that word strongly advise in Asia, it's actually seen as a sign of leadership and, and power. So it works differently in different places. For instance, in Asia, I noticed, and I went under fire on, a, on an article that I wrote on a famous website, but now I slip off my mind, I don't remember. But I wrote an article where you have to walk in the room, give your business card and start talking business. In the Middle East, it doesn't work that way. In Africa, it doesn't work that way. In Europe, it doesn't work that way. Nowhere else doesn't work that way, except in Asia. That's the Asian way of doing business. So long that you are able to adapt, that's how you make it work in your field. Recently, I was talking to a friend of mine, which is a Indian, became Singaporean citizen, working in a company as a sales uh, team leader. 
the team is mostly of Indian origin or Chinese. So there are obviously two different approaches to sales. And so she is in a position now where some of them are not performing. And so she's sharing with me, she's telling me, what am I supposed to do? I'm trying to coach them. And, and sometimes I say, well, there is a line that you have to draw. You can't coach forever. You will realize that some leaders, sometimes they take unpopular decisions. You look at the uh, Jeff Bezos, the famous emails that sends with a question marks only. Steve Jobs, when he died, of course, everyone celebrated him, but then started uh, emerging a few controversial views on him. Um, or Jack Ma that tells you, you have to work six days a week from nine to nine. That's how you're supposed to work. So leaders are not kind, the successful one. And in fact, you're talking to one that is not successful. <laughs> I'm not a multimillionaire, and, and therefore I am not successful. If you talk to the multimillionaire, multi-billionaires, they turn out not, they are not nice people to be with. Or maybe, yes, for a steak and a glass of Coke, they, they, they might be fun people to have a chat with. But then working with them is really stressful. And I prefer to work, not to be to that degree of success, but going to work happy, not constantly on. I used to be in a race for earning as much as possible. I'm not in, on that race anymore. I rather enjoy some time spent with my friends and go to work happily than being on a constant doggy dog competitive environment. It, it, probably I'm too old for that or just too wise. <laughs> And that's interesting, right? Because, you know, you talk about how you've been supportive of so many people and teams across different cultures and geographies. What are some common myths or misconceptions that people have about cross-cultural communications? Interesting question. I would say that the most common thing that I heard is everyone thinks they are unique. And I beg to disagree on the largest majority of common elements of culture and communication, which means... If I go to talk to Malaysians, they will tell me, oh, Malaysia is different. If I talk to Singaporeans, they say, oh, yeah, but our culture is different. If I talk to Arabs, they tell me the same thing. Africans, they tell me, oh, in Uganda is different than Kenya. Or even in Italy, I come from North Italy, they will tell me the South Italy is different. And so everyone will emphasize the differences and they will tell you to change strategy because if you use underpinning common strategies, they will not work for them because they are too specific. But in my opinion, what they are doing, they are taking the 10, 20% that makes them different and think that they can buy based on that. Matter of fact is that largest majority of the cases, you will find an underpinning common ground. Take, for instance, McDonald's that enters in every country with exactly the same base products. And then on top of that, adds the flavor. Here in Malaysia, they just launched the Ayam Goreng, the fried chicken for this region. Or in the case of KFC in Indonesia, that sells rice, which I don't think they do in the United States or wherever you, you go, there is a little degree of adaptation, but the underpinning structure of cultural communication is exactly the same. There are taboos that are cross-culture. These things you will not do anywhere. There are also some other things that you have to adapt with, which is the, the spending power. When I was in Uganda the first time, I went for a meeting. I wanted to purchase a company and I went to meet the founding members of the company. And then we met in a cafe and then each of us ordered. And then uh, the eight of them together, they couldn't pay the bill. They didn't have enough money to pay for coffee and those little things that they ordered. And I actually took the bill, but that puts you in a completely different scenario where you're sitting with eight grown-up adults owning a company and they don't have enough money to buy coffee today and maybe tomorrow as well. So it's a, it's a really challenging situation. Not at all what I experienced in the Middle East where I purchased a second-hand car from a gentleman and when we went to the police uh, to register the car in my name, there were about uh, 250 US dollars worth of fines on my car, which I didn't know. And he told me, don't you dare to pay your own fines. I pay for your fines. <laughs> so you, you find the extreme of someone that is willing to pay my fines just for the sake of showing they wants to be friendly. And on the other side, a group of uh, chaps that I'm thinking of buying their company that they, they don't have enough money to pay for my coffee. That was really interesting. Or for instance, in Asia, the typical example of the karaoke rooms, right? They try to shower you with attention that sometimes are even not welcome, but then you play along because you want to immerse or, immer or merge with the culture. Yeah, that's so true. And that rhymes with my own experience. Many people ask me, what's the difference between the US and Singapore? And I'm like, well, the similarities are way higher between US and Singapore. I remember... So many people in Singapore <laughs> listen to Britney Spears, right? Growing up, and lots of Americans have listened to Britney Spears growing up, right? So there's a lot of commonality here. But more dissimilarities when we're talking about 
differences in household income level, right? Those are things that really kind of like drive a ton of difference in terms of like outlook and even career path and things like that. I guess one interesting thing that you've really helped spearhead a lot of the regional expansion, right? For other companies coming to Southeast Asia, right? Setting up offices or helping them set up the regional office. How would you think about the advice you normally give to them for anybody who's thinking about setting up in Southeast Asia? Uh, that's a really good question. I actually got this question a few times in the past few years. I'd say that Singapore is probably still the good spot to start with. I don't think it's going to remain the best spot moving forward, given the condition that the expat community or let's say the foreign talents that go to Singapore, they are not enjoying it being in Singapore at the moment. In fact, I read numbers. I don't want to quote any numbers for the sake of not being wrong, but with a quite a number of zeros behind of people that have left Singapore because they prefer to be in a place like I am now. I'm in Johor last weekend. I took my car. I drove one hour and a half. I was on the beach in the Saro for the weekend. And in Singapore, if you drive one hour, you can go from Changi to Jurong and Jurong to Changi. There is nothing much that you can do. Moreover, the social aspect is limiting. It used to be that you go to Singapore because the social life is amazing. They used to live in Club Street in Singapore tells you a lot about my philosophy, about lifestyle. But then when you strip that away, similarly, my brother is in Bangkok, is telling me the same thing. A lot of expatriates say, hey, it's no longer fun to be here. I better move somewhere else. And that's where I think the, the countries in Asia are not putting enough emphasis on the fact that if you want to attract foreign talents, it's not just about money, but the way they spend the money. And spending the money is something that everyone does based on what they like. And if you start removing the things that they like, then probably they make a different decision. Money is not everything. Lifestyle is very much. So in one example that I work, I work for a Russian company setting up shop in Singapore, wanting to expand in Indonesia. There was a challenge, frankly, because it's not just about cost of acquisition of customers. It was a B2C model, but the cost of acquisition is just the tip of the iceberg. You have a massive cost of localization language, first of all. You have cost of retention because you're not the only one entering there. So there is endless number of companies are trying to do exactly the same thing they do. In fact, when they enter in Singapore, they had two competitors globally. By the time they left Singapore, they had 51 competitors in the region. <laughs> so it was just ramping. There was a big lesson that I learned. It sounds very appealing when you think, oh, wow, uh, Indonesia, 280 million people. Vietnam, 100 million people. Philippines, you know, yeah, well, people that don't speak your language. So first of all, you've got to adapt and localize, which is the same thing. Even in Singapore, at any underground level, when you have multiple languages occurring, before the election, for example, I can read everything I want to read about politics, and I will get it from one or two or three sources that are in English language. You'll probably go through multiple resources because you can read in English, you can read in Chinese, and therefore you have a very different opinion that I have. You get information in Singlish from hardware zone that I don't understand. And so you have a better pulse of the local community that I might even wish to have in in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And this one is experienced everywhere. When I went to the Middle East, of course, I can read in in English, but guess what? The largest majority of the population speaks Arabic. And and despite I can read Arabic, I can speak a bit of Arabic, but I will never grasp the full understanding of what they experience or what they think. I can communicate to them on a broader level. I remember having this conversation with my business partner in the Middle East to say, you have to be like us. You have to be an Arab if you want to understand how to sell to Arabs. Yes, true, fair enough. But yet, look, you're driving a car that is made in in, in Germany. Your television is made in Japan. Your phone is made in Korea. Your social media is American. The cup that you are using to drink coffee that comes from uh, Dubai, the cup comes from China. I mean, the manpower that built your house comes from Bangladesh. The material comes from Italy. Look, none of these is produced where you live, and yet you bought it. So you, you can't expect that everything is from Oman, and therefore you buy everything in Oman. You are adaptable, and Samsung never changed the strategy when they came to Middle East. They do the same thing that they do anywhere else in the world. You like the product, you buy the product. They, they don't adapt to you, you adapt to them. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the businesses have a very clear eye that they're part of a global system, right? You know, suppliers and our distributors, global players, multi-regions, multiple nationalities and multiple cultures and just doing multiple activities all at once, right? And at the same time, you know, kind of sharing something that is so true, which is that from an individual perspective, there's been 
especially in such a pandemic year, right? We've seen borders closing. We've seen every country in the world, right? European countries. We've seen America. We've seen Asian countries all throughout the borders and have that shrinking of the tribe, right? Of the village, right? To who's here. And so how would you think about that? You know, what's the, I don't know, win-win situation for the future, right? Where, like you said, our daily lifestyle is only made possible because of how tightly everybody is working with each other across the world, right? To make our lifestyles possible. Yeah, it feels like psychologically people are like shrinking their tribe. So how would you think about that? I think we live in the present generally. And so we have very short uh, historic memory. And so I think within 2025, we barely remember what happened in 2020, 2021. As soon as things go back to normal, there will be something else to be worried about. There might be another war somewhere and there are plenty of wars happening every year. There will be another crisis, humanitarian crisis, health crisis, economic crisis. These things have been happening for the entire history of mankind. So it's nothing new. It's just that we live in the present and we worry for the present. For instance, when I hear the new normal, I, inside me, I laugh. Of course, it's not new normal. It's not going to be here forever. It's going to be for a few years and then it'll change. The same way when the internet came out and they were scoffing at it, ha ha, whoever, who will use the internet or the mobile phones? First time I, I showed up at the, at the bar with my friends in 1997 with a, with a mobile phone in my pocket, they laughed at me. I said, why are you bring out a mobile phone? Who's going to call you? I mean, if I need to talk to you, I call you at home when you're at home. Or even video conferencing, you probably remember some of the community, it will never work because who wants in their right mind to have a camera in the house that might film you when you get out of the shower? And therefore, they laughed at it. Books like Fooled by Randomness or The Black Zone, they talk about this topic in great details that you can't predict what will happen, but you can assume that everything will be pretty much the same. When I was a kid in primary school, they say that by 2020, we would have had flying cars. We would have colonized other planets. I tell you, I don't think it's going to happen for the next 200 years or, or ever. It, would, it probably never happened. We're just doing the same things with the same technologies that we had before. And in the book Anti-Fragility, they clearly make it a point that the longer a technology has been around, the longer the technology is going to stay the wheel is the longest technology has been around. And guess what? You're still driving a car that has four wheels, four seats, or pretty much two in front and a few back, a steering wheel. Then, yes, you can add on top of the technology all you want, but the bicycle has been the same. Airplane, cinema has been the same thing. Motion pictures, photography, these things are here to stay. Then you tell me, I can't travel. Okay, fair enough. I can't travel for now. Then you find countries that say, yes, you can travel. Uganda and Dubai, they are already doing that. No quarantine, just go in and go out. It's okay. And in some countries, they will start to do that. And then all of a sudden, the number one source of entertainment will not be going on a Singapore Airlines landed airplane to eat a very expensive meal of decent or inferior quality watching a movie on a small size screen because of the novelty. But it will be like, hey, you know what? The Mauritius, like random name, yeah, it might be any other countries. The Mauritius has opened up the border, no need for quarantine. I'm going to go there. And the first country that does do that, it, it will trigger a domino effect on all the others. Now they are doing it in Africa. And not many people want to go on holiday in Africa. But if one country say, hey, we are safe, or they, they will say, they, they say that if you compare it to H1N1, the flu that hit what, a decade ago, they say that 1.1 billion people in the world had it. 1.1 billion. But imagine that is that magnitude of reaching. Today, I read an article about Italy say that up to 8 million people might have had COVID already, and just they are quoting tens of thousands. Let, let's imagine that we really had to hit 1.1 billion with COVID. Given that statistics say that in young people, the mortality is really little. It, it, and again, it depends on how you read numbers, right? If you say it's double as deadly as flu, yeah, but, but flu is not really deadly. It's 10 times as deadly as flu, yeah, it's still not deadly. I mean, you have higher chances of getting killed today on the road in Kampala, Uganda, by driving the car to the mall than someone my age with my fitness level of dying of COVID within the next three years. So I experienced different level of risk. And, and so sooner or later, some countries say, hey, even now, Malaysia announced last week, say 95% of the cases are asymptomatics. Cristiano Ronaldo yesterday tweeted, the test is BS. I mean, sooner or later, someone had to address the elephant in the room that the largest majority of people that test positive is not sick. Sooner or later, for instance, here in Malaysia, those that are traveling between Kuala Lumpur and Klang, they test every day. 
So the number of tests are enormous at the moment, a very large amount of tests, and they say cases. They say, oh, today, 800 cases. Okay, how many are sick? So if you do the math, the DG of health says 95% of them are not sick. They are asymptomatic. So out of 800, it's just a handful, 40 of them that have symptoms. And they say mild symptoms. And those that are severe are less than 10. In a country with 35 million people, well, it might be that 10 today are severe for lung cancer and 10 are severe for car accident in Johor. Like, like, there was a massive car accident last week in Johor where people died. And so eventually we cannot stretch this on all over. You see the conversation now in Malaysia. They say we cannot afford another lockdown. In Italy, people throw bombs to the police car last week because they say, no, don't lock down. People are going in the squares and chanting and singing and say, I decide how I want to die, if I want to die at home or if I want to die in any other way. And so you will find more this one in Europe because, of course, in Europe, we started having democracy. A long time ago, I say the French Revolution in 1789 opened up the door to say whatever you want. But look at what's happening in, in Thailand at the moment. For instance, people is going in the street now and, and complaining about the approach of the king. So bottom line is every country has their own struggle, every country has their own approach. But I think that moving forward, those that are going to benefit from economics are those that are going to be inclusive rather than exclusive. All right. Thank you so much for coming aboard, Stefano. Thank you for having me.